Good evening and welcome to Capital Connection, where we join the dots for the big picture of business in Africa. I'm Chris Bishop. Now on the agenda, we examine the illicit trade of wildlife, one of the contributors to the 60% decline in animal species around the world. The trade of exotic animals for pets or parts is an industry whose worth is estimated to run into hundreds of millions of dollars. The trade of rhino horns, elephant tusks, pelamon and pangolins are among the favourites for poachers. Stronger laws, better enforcement, harsher punishments and farming are some of the proposed solutions to poaching. How do we do better implementation of these solutions and what else can be done? Now, the illegal wildlife trade criminal syndicates are ruthlessly pursuing profits to meet consumer demand. But really, what are the numbers? Joining us via Skype from London to give us a comprehensive picture of the damage already done is Dr. Richard Thomas, the Global Communications Coordinator of the Wildlife Trade Monitoring Network, Traffic. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us, Richard. Now, that's that first question. I mean, what kind of numbers are we talking about in animals and what kind of numbers are we talking about in money in this trade? Well, in terms of individual animals, uh, the ones that we most know the figures most accurately for are rhinos. Uh, and we're seeing something like uh, 769 rhinos uh, were killed, poached last year in South Africa alone. Uh, prior to that, uh, the numbers were even higher, up to 1,215 animals in one year in South Africa. And it's starting to have a knock-on effect that uh, rhino populations are beginning to fall. The other iconic animal, African animal, that's being heavily impacted by poaching is the African elephant. Uh, we don't know quite as precisely how many uh, individuals are being killed, but it's of the order of 20,000 animals a year. Uh, and it's obviously uh, unacceptably way too high. And the saddest part about the whole story you're painting here is that as the animals become more scarce, their value goes up, which presumably attracts even more gangs looking for them. Precisely. We can get into a, a vicious circle here where because things are becoming rarer, their value goes up and the demand, if it's not, uh, if it's carrying on or even increasing, uh, it will inevitably lead to the extinction of these species. What can be done about it? Well, ultimately, uh, it's a question of uh, stemming the demand uh, that's coming from Asia. Now, this is a long term process, but um, it is a long term solution. And that means um, persuading the people who are currently using or trying to get hold of uh, the products, elephant ivory or rhino horn, uh, to switch to something else or simply not to use those products in any way. But in the meantime, there's a much more immediate crisis uh, taking place in Africa at the source. Uh, and to stem that, we obviously need uh, the rangers on the ground who are out patrolling to be uh, well equipped and well trained so that they can uh, protect the animals and uh, prevent the, the actual poaching from taking place. But right along the trade chain, we need to make sure that the, uh, the people, the authorities who are in charge of trying to detect the products once they've been uh, poached, so the customs officers and the airport uh, baggage handlers and so on, are well trained and equipped to uh, find these materials uh, and intercept them. And of course, uh, those who are carrying out these activities need to be caught uh, and importantly, once they are caught, uh, they're given obviously a fair trial, but if convicted, they receive uh, punishments that are appropriate for the seriousness of the crime, so that the punishment is into the deterrent category uh, to put others off from following in their footsteps. I mean, all of this costs money, this, this prevention, this monitoring of this trade, the, the um, policing of this trade. Where, where's that money going to come from? Well, uh, Obviously, it does cost money, but on the other side of the coin, uh, if you lose these iconic animals, that's going to cost money too, because uh, visiting Africa is a huge draw for tourists all over the world who wish to see some of these iconic animals in the wild. And obviously, if, they, if they're not able to do so, that will reduce the, the tourist uh, interest. So it's important that money is put into this. 
Uh, a lot of it is coming from private sources. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, rhinos and things are on private game ranches. But ultimately, I guess it's down to the governments, and it's really governments who have the, the backing uh, and the political will and commitment uh, to put in place the measures that are needed to uh, try and stem the poaching that is uh, destroying Africa's natural resources. Thank you very much for your time and insights. That was Richard Thomas, the Global Communications Coordinator at Traffic. Now, the South African Constitution does not explicitly provide for the protection of wildlife. A narrow scope of legislation and enforcement has been linked to the continent's slow response rate to animal trafficking. Now, joining us now to discuss the limitation and prospects for development in the way of environmental law is Adila Agji, an attorney at the Centre for Environmental Rights. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, it seems that the, the laws here at the moment, they're, they're full of holes when it comes to animals. What can be done about it? Well, we have quite a vast array of well thought out um, legislation into, uh, f providing for conservation of animals. Um, I think that where we hit a roadblock is the implementation and enforcement of that legislation due to various reasons and one of them being a lack of capacity and resources and budgetary constraints um, in the Department of Environmental Affairs and the Provincial um, Conservation Agencies. That's one of the problems isn't it? I was mentioned that, uh, earlier in the programme that who's going to pay for all of this and government coffers the world over are running dry. Yes, there are decreasing budgets every year. Um, the National um, Department of Environmental Affairs has a number of, of different focuses and uh, wildlife is one of, and conservation is one of the smaller um, aspects of all the things that they have to deal with and so it doesn't get a lot of that pie of the budget. So could any changes to the law actually do any um, good in bearing in mind that there is little money? Yes. Well, we need to start looking at innovative, innovative ways um, in which to deal with this problem. Um, the law alone can't solve the problems, but certainly can assist. So we've got to look at um, deterrence, firstly, um, addressing the, the demand um, and the reason that the supply is, is, is so lucrative, the supplying that demand is so lucrative um, by uh, syndicates and crime, um, uh, yeah, crime syndicates. The law can help in, um, in, in being a deterrent in increasing the sentences um, that are currently being uh, imposed on um, wildlife traffickers. Um, while our national legislation um, provides for uh, minimum, sorry, maximum pa penalties of 10 million rand and 10 years imprisonment per offence, we aren't seeing these um, penalties being translated into actual sentences in the courts. Um, so the deterrent value um, is quite low at the moment. And that's the whole point though, isn't it? Also the other end of the deal, the actual law enforcement agencies, do you think they're up to protecting this country's animals from this illegal trade? Mm. Yes, so I mean certainly a lot has been done in about the last five years um, in ramping up um, capacity in that regard, especially at the Kruger National Park. We, uh, we almost have like a military operation um, and lots of expensive security, surveillance equipment, um, things that have been brought in to deal with, with the rhino approaching crisis. However, uh, while the focus has now been so largely on rhino poaching, there are other animals that um, are losing out. Um, our elephant poaching is on the rise. Um, a lot of the, the less iconic animals like pangolins, which are the most widely trafficked um, and poached um, animals in the world, um, are not receiving as much attention um, from the department uh, or, or the, the government um, uh, because of the, the huge rhino poaching crisis. Um, so while we're looking this way, um, poachers are, are going <laughs> through the back door. Well, public perception is as well, is that if you are caught for something like trafficking an animal, it's highly unlikely in this country that you're going to end up uh, in prison or, or these, why are, isn't this stuff being enforced? Yes, well, um, again, uh, on the positive side, we've seen um, increased numbers of arrests and, and trials and then um, successful convictions and sentencing of, 
um, of these wildlife crimes. However, the focus seems to have been uh, a little too much on targeting the, the people on the ground, the middlemen, and not so much targeting the, the actual uh, king, pink kingpins of uh, uh, the poaching syndicates. And so we've got a lot more arrests and, and, and convictions but um, of people who are easily replaceable. And then obviously there, there are lots of instances where people are let out on bail uh, and just disappear. Um, uh, even where sentences are being served, they're let out um, early on parole, things like that. Um, so uh, compared to the, the cost of, um, of, of all these horns and, and um, other um, very expensive um, animal products, uh, a few years in jail, is, it doesn't seem to be much of a deterrent. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Adila. That was uh, Adila Agji, an attorney from the Center for Environmental Rights. Now, despite controversy from animal rights activists, could farming and trading wild animals be a solution to poaching? Can the legal sale of exotic wild animals become a thriving agricultural sector? Now, joining us now to explore this controversial solution is Tris van Kolle, the president of the Professional Hunting Association of South Africa. So thank you very much for joining us. So your belief is, or before we get to your beliefs, maybe just say you're 1,200 um, professional hunters. Uh, just tell us a little bit of something, because I'm sure a lot of people out there think, well, you're hunting animals all day. <laughs> exactly what do you do? Okay. Well, um, yes, we, we are hunting, but necessarily we are hunting with hunting guests to our country. Uh, it's a legal requirement for us to accompany any hunter coming to our country that's not normally a resident of our country. So uh, we've got to ensure that he meets all the legal requirements, uh, that he selects the right animals, uh, and that his safety is of, of paramount concern. In this present uh, climate, when it comes to wildlife and also the economy, are you noticing more or fewer um, visitors coming to Africa to shoot animals? Um, I think it's, it's, it's quite a misleading um, topic as such, because a lot of people say, yes, there's less coming there. It depends who you ask. Mm. Um, and I think it's a very, very varied opinion. Um, we see, and from the statistics we have of last year, that foreign hunters visiting South Africa in particular, where South Africa is a little different to the rest of Africa, where we have a private ownership model. Um, we saw basically an increase of about a thousand hunters coming to our country last year. So yes, there, there, there is an increase um, in our statistics showing that people are coming to our country to, to hunt. Um, for the rest of Africa, I can't speak on that behalf. So um, you believe, I mean, one of the issues we've looked into on this program is the shortage of money to stop this illegal um, trade in wildlife that's killing um, the amount of wildlife in the, the continent. But you believe if there was a lesser legal trade, then that would yield money to stop the illegal trade. Well, I think you've got to take one thing into consideration. We've got a, a very difficult situation with poverty. Now, uh, when you have uh, high levels of poverty, you will have levels of, 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 of poaching and illegal trade. Uh, there's the commercial trade and there's the subsistence uh, poaching as such. Um, money does alleviate a lot of those issues. And I think we'd be naive to look at it in any other way to say it, it won't alleviate the problems. Um, Well-regulated, controlled hunting uh, does facilitate. And the utilization of all these resources wisely does, does make a big difference in there. So yes, uh, it, it does contribute at the end of the day for money to enter into the system. Um, and it will alleviate a lot of of the poverty issues that we are dealing with. How, how would you see it working? Well, at, at this stage, I think one of the, the biggest things is there's such a lot of regulation in place. People don't understand the, 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 the implications and the regulation that we've got to abide to. Um, I, th I think it, it, it's actually very restrictive uh, to, to operating a, any business unit as such. The amount of people we employ at the end of the day is also very restrictive because of the regulations we have in place. If we control, and at this stage, I think our biggest challenge in, in, in South Africa as such, we've got adequate regulation. It's the enforcement of the regulation that's the, the problems coming forward. Um, where, where we've got legal trade going forward here is I think we've got the mechanisms in place. And as I said earlier, please don't compare us with the rest of Africa. Uh, we've got a very sound, very um, successful wildlife model. Uh, and that has contributed to the conservation of, of our species in Africa. And by the utilization thereof, we, we've got resources that we can put back in, into our economy. And just lastly, very briefly, what worries you most about the situation that we are in at the moment regarding wildlife in Africa? The biggest concern for me is emotion. 
Um, people have come up and personified animals. Uh, they do not understand what it is to be on the ground, uh, to have your family in, in, in danger. Human-animal conflict is real. Uh, and it's these things, people sitting abroad don't understand the challenges we face. Uh, there are real challenges. Uh, people are losing their lives. People are losing their livelihoods. Uh, and we need to benefit that. There's too much emotion involved. We need to have a clear, concise, scientific-based uh, research done and, and, and uh, inform, uh, information generated from that. Uh, and then that will guide us on, on how we go forward from there. Coming up after the break, Rachel Neuer, an award-winning journalist, talks about her travels to uncover the dark world of poaching. Do stay tuned. <music> Welcome back. You're watching Capital Connection and I'm Chris Bishop. Now we're joined now by Rachel Neuer. She is one of the brave individuals who is helping to expose the criminals behind the wildlife trafficking business through her Pulitzer sponsored book, Poached Inside the Dark World of Wildlife Trafficking. She is joining us all the way from Germany via Skype. Oh, Rachel Neuer, you traveled extensively in Africa, researching the story, poached inside the dark world of wildlife trafficking. How much despair did you find along the road? Yes, Chris. Um, writing this book, there was no way possible to do it from my desk in Brooklyn. I knew I had to travel to Africa to see the impacts of this awful illegal trade for myself. Um, my travels took me from South Africa, of course, to Malawi, Kenya, Tanzania, Namibia, Chad and more. It's it's difficult when immersed in this subject not to get overcome by despair, but if you succumb to that despair, then there's no solution possible. You're you're basically accepting that we've lost this battle. So for me, yes, I would dabble in in that despair, but I always set my sights on what was next, how we could stop this. I mean, some of the um some of the statistics you, you put in the book here, you said uh, there's something like 30,000 rhinos left disappearing at about 1,000 a year. Um, it means in 30 years, our, our grandchildren will never ever see such an animal. Right. I mean, there is some great signs that South Africa, for example, is managing to curtail that killing. That's come at a tremendously steep cost um, in terms of rhino lives, ranger lives and uh, money just invested in security. But yes, at this point, rhino deaths do seem to outweigh births. We're still losing the battle. And what about the people who, who often give their lives to protect them? You must have spent quite a bit of time with them. We've done a lot of stories on them down the years. How hard are they working just, just to hold the line against the poachers in Africa? Yes, the ranges are also often referred to as the thin green line. They're, you know, the line between what's stopping just complete want and destruction of wildlife and the, the animals that will be around for the future. These are incredible individuals. Um, I met the uh, first anti-poaching armed group of female rangers, Akashinga in Zimbabwe, for example. And these are women who are you know, willing to give up their lives to stop poachers from killing their natural resources. However, across the continent, rangers are grossly underfunded, usually, for the work they do. They're lacking basic necessities. Um, they, they don't have life insurance in the event that something happens to them. So it, it really bothers me to see us fueling all this money into high-tech solutions for stopping illegal wildlife and poaching when really we need to just equip the men and women in the field so that they can better do their job. And the sad uh, part about this whole thing, again, according to your book, this dark world of wildlife trafficking, as you called it, it's worth an estimated $15 billion a year. Now, that figure is going to increase as these animals get rarer and rarer. Surely, sadly, this is still good business that's going to attract a lot of people. Oh, for sure. I mean, the great thing about wildlife trafficking, if you're a criminal, is it's a low-risk, 
high reward crime. Um, unlike things like drugs, arms, human trafficking, wildlife criminals, especially those at the top are hardly ever arrested and they're even more rarely prosecuted for their crimes. Uh, when when they are prosecuted, you know, it might be a small fine or a few years in jail. It's nothing like the punishments uh, you would see with drugs. And we really need to start treating this as what it is, an organized international criminal contraband worth billions of dollars. Otherwise, wildlife really doesn't have a chance. And, uh, you know, just, just looking to the, the future, I mean, how much more desperate do you think are the poachers and criminals? Uh, I remember 20 odd years ago filming some black rhinos in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, 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 get, the ranger told me, he said, it'd be worth your while to land a full-size plane here if you could afford one because the return you'll get on the rhino horn is a lot worth a lot more than the plane. How much more desperate are the poachers getting in the 21st century? Yeah, I mean, the sad fact is uh, human population is only going to continue to skyrocket and so is poverty. We've got things like climate change exas exacerbating that. So unless we find a solution for people, people are going to continue to poach. I mean... It makes total sense to me why someone who is poor would want to get a rhino horn. It's, it's hard to argue with that logic. So we need to find solutions for local people living with wildlife. And at the same time, we must start to curtail demand for these things. If people were not buying rhino horn, then people would not be killing rhinos for their horn. And what about uh, the conservationists themselves, the, the difference in attitudes sometimes? And I covered a CITES conference back in, I think, 97, oh. where the culling of elephants was lifted. And I can remember the two reactions. You had people from the World Wildlife Foundation and animal defenders who were weeping openly on that day. And yet you had the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Department who were singing celebratory songs because they knew that the departments were going to get more money from the culling of elephants and the selling of the rhino. Have you come across that much in your research for your book? Absolutely. Um, one conservationist once told me that uh, wildlife conservation is actually more complex than nuclear physics, for example, or it's, it's people, it's animals, it's ecosystems. It's very, very difficult to disentangle these things and understand exactly what will work because of that people element. So yes, a lot of people in Southern Africa especially argue that we should have sustainable use of things like ivory and rhino horn. Others in Kenya, for example, or predominantly in the U.S. say that no, we should have zero offtake of these, we should have no sale of ivory. The truth is we don't know what will work, but time is running out for these species. I mean, that's another point again, you know, how, how difficult is it to police these things? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a believer in killing anyone or anything. And I've been approached in, in bars in Africa. People say, oh, do you want to shoot oh, some wow. rhinos? Do you want to shoot elephants? And I always say, no, thank you very much. But as if uh, someone's selling you, uh, uh, someone's selling you a packet of cigarettes or something. Uh, it's something that, I don't know, how do you think it can be policed? I'm going to ask you a bit more about the possible solutions, but what do you know from your research in your book? In terms of trophy hunting, um, this is a hard pill to swallow, especially for a lot of Western viewers, but if it's done well, it can provide funds for conservation and it can be sustainable. The fact of the matter is we live in a, a people-dominated world and a lot of people, in order to justify the existence of animals, they need to be making some kind of money off of them. Um, I'm not one of those people. I think species have an intrinsic right to be here, just like you and I do. Um, but if it can be done sustainably, I'm all for it. And we've talked a lot about the, the problems here. Um, you spent quite a lot of time writing and researching this book. What would be your solution in the African continent? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, if I had a magic wand, I would, uh, first of all, make corruption disappear. Without corruption, we would be halfway toward winning. Uh, secondly, and most importantly, is to provide livelihoods for the people who currently lack any other option except for poaching. Poverty drives this enterprise at its most basic level. The poachers, they aren't wealthy guys coming in to steal the rhino horn. They're, you know, guys who have no other option, desperate villagers just getting a few bucks for basically putting their, their lives at risk and their freedom at risk just to feed their families. 
So corruption, poverty, and lastly, beyond the African continent, uh, I would wave my magic wand and get rid of demand for these things. If we could solve those three things, there would be no illegal wildlife trade. What was the most shocking thing you discovered in writing this book? I think the most shocking thing for me and the most distressing was the impunity with which this trade uh, continues, especially in Asia. Um, I'm not Asian. I don't speak uh, Vietnamese or Chinese. And yet, time and time again, I was uh, able to openly interview people who, who traffic in these things, who use these products, these illegal products. I was able to go to markets and restaurants and find things like um, pangolin for sale on menus. Uh, so until we actually start policing this and taking it seriously, we really have uh, a, an uphill battle. And that's where we leave it. Thank you to all my guests on tonight's edition of Capital Connection. Join us again every Monday and Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central African time. From me, Chris Bishop, it's good night. Thank you.